uh, graduated from Sciences Po Paris with a Master of Art in International Development. Estelle Bouniafoumedjou is uh, the founder in advanced teaching is in progress for University of the People and the International Baccalaureate. Estelle specializes in the creation and management of projects for, for social change um, and the design of innovative educational practices. Thank you for being with us, Estelle. So while you share my presentation, I'll take the opportunity to meet everyone. Good afternoon, uh, Anla, as we say in Bamako, I'm in Bamako right now, in Bambara. Um, that's how you say it in my home language as well. Good afternoon. Um, so yeah, it's a great pleasure to be part of this um, conference. I've known Estelle for maybe two or three years now, and uh, she's always been a great inspiration, and I'm so proud of the work that she's doing today. Um, we work together on a professional development workshop for um, international educators called TWICE. So it's teaching with inclusion and culture embedded. So it's a workshop that uh, we launched last year and we've been working essentially with um, uh, international schools in Africa and also with the International School of Geneva. And um, basically, <clears throat> The work that we do is about nurturing cultural inclusion, making sure that everybody is heard uh, and present in, in international schools. So today I'm going to be talking about um, anti-racism in African history. Um, the reason why um, Estelle suggested that I, that I be the panelist on this topic is because I've um, created last year a 14-hour course on the history of race and racism, the history of uh, resistance to prejudice, the collateral damages of history in our societies, and the commitment to anti-racism. It's, it's a course called ROPAS, Racial Orientation Program for African Students, or Racial Orientation Program for Anti-Racist Students. Um, the reason why I was initially focused on African students was because I wanted to equip um, students who had gr grown up there all their lives, like me, for example, um, on the continent with a different notion of race, uh, to be prepared to go and live, to, to, to go to universities in areas where they were going to become a minority, uh, for the most part, um, uh, in, for the first time also. And, uh, and also embrace a new sort of connection to races. Uh, the, the reason why um, it quickly developed to being a racial orientation program for anti-racist students is because overall it equips any young person who is seeking to understand the systems of oppression and injustice in the world and know how they can be change makers in that situation. So today uh, I'll be using some of the information that I um, share during that course to make the link between African history and anti-racism. Um, I've taught ROPAS to students in Mali and in Japan and in the UK and Switzerland. So, um, you can go to the next slide. Yeah, oh, even that we can. Okay, so basically what I have to say is that uh, it's not so, so complicated in my experience. Uh, it's almost impossible to teach anti-racism without teaching African history. Um, and that's because um, I use a, a specific definition of racism because to teach anti-racism, we need to first be all aware of the language that we're using and under understand what uh, racism means. And what we understand with racism is that um, it was fundamentally, well, it was funded on um, this falsification of, of history. And in the sense that it really brought um, to, I mean, it, it, it erased a huge part of history. Um, and it's important to, for students to understand that because then they'll also understand um, the logic behind racism and um, it would help them better understand what it means for them to adopt racist behaviors or not adopt racist behaviors. 
So uh, looking at the definition of racism, the one that I used during the courses is one by Ibram uh, Zolani Kendi, who wrote the book, How to Be an Anti-Racist, published in 2019. And he explains that racism is a powerful collection of racist policies that lead to racial inequity and are substantiated by racist ideas. By racist policies, he means, um, Estelle, if you can click on the, on the slide, uh, and he suggests any policy that um, basically creates inequity between uh, racialized groups. So when we look at uh, racist policies, in fact, the terminology racist is something that is more recent, but before it became a phenomenon, be before we, we named race, race and racism, um, we can understand racist policies are, are self-interested policies or also imperialistic policies, capitalistic policies, one of the example being um, the, slave, the slave trade. But an example of modern racist policies could be uh, discrimina discriminatory policies against hair, for example, in some institutions. Uh, what type of hair you can, you can wear or not wear, depending on your gender or your ethnicity. It can be housing policies, who is allowed to live where, etc. So race, racist policies lead to race, racial inequity. So racial inequity uh, being just um, any, um, is when two or more racial groups are not standing on equal or approximately equal footing. And racist ideas is really any idea um, that suggests that one racial group is inferior to another group in any way. Um, and it's really important to understand that um, it is not the diversity that created uh, hate or racism. It is not the fact that people were, that there were diversity on the world that created, that created those racist ideas. It is the racist policies that needed justification. And that justification came through the creation, the construction of race and racism. The construction of race came with racism. Um, it was almost basically systematic. Once we applied the classification of, um, of you know, race in a scientific term is about classification of living beings. When it got applied to uh, classification of living beings, when it got applied to human beings, it came with a hierarchy of inferiority and superiority. Um, and that is something that is important to understand. And so to focus on uh, very, I mean, the core of the matter. Um, Estelle, could you move the, um, uh, click on the slide? Yeah, we can, yeah, we can move to the next slide. Um, so yes, yeah, so I explain here um, that racism is found in the falsification of African history or just history in general, because um, we'll, we'll look at the architecture of racism or the architects of racism. Um, basically, you know, it's founded on this idea that uh, the further you move from whiteness, the least human you are. Um, so, and it's also based on this idea that people didn't have any history or that, but we can clearly see uh, with, you know, tremendous evidence that of course people had a, uh, history, but not only did they have history, they had also an, a clear understanding of the wide diversity of communities that you had on um, on the face of the earth. So this painting is, you know, from is dating from uh, 1,200 years BC before the Common Era, and it shows that basically Egyptians, ancient Egyptians saw themselves, you know, represented here. So you have ancient Egyptian A and other um, black population, other Africans population C. And you see that they also represented Indo-European groups and the semi group just with a clear understanding of the diversity. Um, I mean, not a clear understanding, but at least acknowledgement of the diversity, but it didn't necessarily create any form of racism there. Another important thing to, to understand is that at the center of racism, it was also this idea of anti-Black racism. So this was what I was explaining as white being the, the, the starting, I mean, the highest point and everything under going below to the darkest color. 
Uh, so anti-black racism was also founded on this idea that there was nothing of civilization and no humanity on the, dark, on the African continent. And we need to also situate back, um, situate history, you know, in its order. Um, Africa was the birthplace, is the birthplace of human beings. Being the birthplace of human beings also means that it's a birthplace of civilization uh, as old as 6,000 years um, BC. You have just here the paintings of the tomb of Ramses is a is linked to the pharaonic period of ancient Egypt, which dates back from um, the 32nd century BCE up until the 30, um, up until 332 BCE. Just basically um, the point here is to understand that during this, throughout this time, there was a widespread influence of African civilization over modern day Asia, the Americas, the Middle East, and parts of Europe. And um, that influence was in all areas of life, whether it was scientific, um, spiritual, philosophical, uh, medicinal, architectural, agricultural, artistic knowledge. All of that uh, was, if you could just go back, Estelle, to the previous slide. Yeah, and one of them, I mean, the reason why I put Talus here is like, so like many ancient Greeks, um, Talus or Plato or, uh, um, Socrates, I'm sorry, Plato, uh, Herod, Herod, sorry, I forgot. But anyways, so, <laughs> whether it's uh, yeah. all of these ancient Greeks partly studied in ancient Kemet, uh, ancient Egypt. And, you know, the Greek civilization started 800 years uh, BCE, so around 800 years BCE. So basically, um, they even themselves acknowledged that they had studied in ancient Egypt. So it's not as if these things were part of some uh, revelation. Um, however, um, going to the next slide, you, you had to wait until, if you can click again, so you had to wait until um, the 20th century with uh, the, the works of Sheikh Anta Diop for this to become sort of re-acknowledged and reinstated into the minds of people. But he was not popular. He was not popular. And I don't think that before his, his death, he got the credit that he deserved. Um, he, you know, somebody who had to spend his entire life, I mean, part of his work proving that people from ancient Egypt were black people. So this is like, we, we've come a long way, but we haven't really come that far. Uh, while even if you don't only look at him, you had people in the um, Europeans, so in the 19th century, and even before who had, you know, wrote down in books and, and clearly said, I mean, even um, um, how you explain this, um, even the Egyptologists, the archaeologists that who had recognized that um, there was a clear distinction between when civilization started and how far he had, he had come in Africa and other parts of the world. And this is why I said this, it's the classification of African history into brackets because the same applied to Asian history uh, because um, it's the same sort of, you know, classification hierarchy, putting uh, people below whiteness. Um, and, you know, even Europeans acknowledge this, the presence of not only dominance of the African civilizations over the um, entire, I mean, over parts of the entire world and also the, the delay, if I can put it this way, although it's not a competition, it was not a competition, but the, the delay in the creation of the first civilization in Europe. Um, during that wide gap, there was extremely, there, went, there was enough time to have extraordinary advances in, all those fields that I cited before, whether it's medicine, agriculture, um, um, you name it. And it's basically really important for um, students and everybody to remember that 
the foundation that nobody, uh, yes, you can move to the next slide. Um, nobody doubted the greatness of Africa or the diversity and richness of its culture, its scientific knowledge or the humanity of its people until it became necessary to justify imperialistic ideology, ideologies and interests. So a key feature of racism is this rewriting of history, this white washing, you can call it, but just really rewriting of history, not just only white washing. Um, so moving on um, to the next part is, is just to explain how these justifications came from all parts and they were just, and then it started from the interpretation of religious texts to find in there uh, you know, the cursing of, of, of Black people, of descendant of Ham, you know, the, the famous story of the cursing of Ham. If you're not familiar with it, maybe in the questions I could expand more on this. But basically, uh, a son of Noah, whose descendants was cursed. Um, and some people interpreted this to explain that that descendants was um, in an area where you had um, Black people of a darker skin tone, Black or in different shades. And it explains not only that they are the slaves of other races in the world, but that they are, you know, they lack humanity. They're, they have all the negative stereotypes that you are familiar with today. It started uh, very early in, um, in, in, in history after, um, you know, in the, the beginning of, um, after, I mean, after Christ, so after the common, uh, so in the common era, um, and to the creation of pseudosciences in the early 1800s, I mean, er, um, early 1800s with phrenology. So that one was created by um, a German man, Franz Joseph Gall. So the pseudoscience, we call it pseudoscience today, but it was not a pseudoscience. It's something that was in the textbooks in many of many uh, European countries, and especially I know the case of France because I didn't mention that when I was presenting, I mean, in the presentation, but I went to French schools in Mali, um, Guinea and, uh, and Chad, and I studied at a French university. So I'm very uh, aware of the Eurocentric view of the world because that's what I grew up with in terms of history and, and everything. Uh, partly, of course, because I have my African family and I lived in Africa, thankfully, um, I was able to get a balance. But the point here is that um, this creation of pseudosciences uh, was coined in textbooks. So we made sure that children in, in primary school and in, in middle school and in secondary school will get that same narrative that there is a hierarchy of races, um, that uh, this kind of people are like this and those kind of people are like that, that they have no humanity and everything. And those textbooks, for example, in France, um, were um, present from the Third Republic, so during the Third Republic, so the, under Jules Ferry, up until, of course, the occupation, so up until 1940. So some of your parents or grandparents, maybe you may ask, in, those of you who have family in Europe, you may ask them if they ever came across phrenology or craniology or any texts that suggested uh, this inferiority and superiority of textbook of uh, races in their textbooks. Um, interestingly enough, um, those textbooks also mentioned the inferiority of certain occupations over others, even within France. Um, so it was pretty dark for everybody. Um, you had justifications coming from everywhere. Uh, like I said, the creation of human zoos also was a great tool to create uh, or to, to reinforce the narratives of uh, inferiority and superiority. And that, you know, started in the late 1800, 18, uh, nine, in the late 19th century. And um, it continued during the, you know, the entire colonial era. So um, if you're not familiar with human zoos, if you just type, you will get, I mean, do a search, you will find uh, some images and understand the whole narrative behind it, which was to bring, I mean, bring to the common people, the entire, to the masses, this idea of um, inferiority and superiority of certain races. Um, in the midst of all this, just to reinforce again, this idea of, uh, of falsification and complete deceit that racism is founded upon is the fact that in the midst of all this, Africans still govern 
and had real influential empires and kingdoms. Uh, so you can go on and click Estelle because I won't go into detail about each of these. But the idea is that it's not only um, the ancient Egyptian uh, civilizations, but it's also throughout history up until the, the 18th, um, yeah, late 18th century, uh, so before the beginning of colonization, that you had influential empires. The, the image that you have here, Mali Empire, uh, it's an image, it's a depiction by Europeans, is holding a globe, a uh, golden globe in his hand. Not only what would he be, you, you know, holding this globe is to also demonstrate the knowledge of the world that these people had is represented quite in a glorious manner. Uh, you have, you know, the Ethiopian kingdom of Aksum and, and I mean, so many, Ethiopian history is so vast in terms of kingdoms and empires. Um, and you had, you know, in Southern Africa, other, um, other kingdoms like um, the, the kingdom of Mutapata, um, you know, that fell in the late 18th century. So just to, rem to, to make everybody understand once again that it is not, oh, you know, we were not aware that these people existed or we were not aware that these people had created things. They were, pretty, they were very much aware of all of this. Uh, they were very much aware of the long and ancient history of actually um, great relationships between the, the, the different um, European and, and African, but also Asian civilizations. Uh, but it's just, um, it, it reached a point in history where um, other things were motivating this creation of, of races. Um, in the Malian Empire, you know, you have the famous city of Timbuktu, where again, scholars came to learn uh, from, you know, from everywhere in the world, they came to learn astronomy and, and sciences and, and philosophy and religion as well. Um, and even uh, if we could go back to, to the next, if we could go to the next slide, sorry. And again, just to reinforce this, <laughs> once again, even if we're to think that, oh, okay, all of this was happening in Africa and they were maybe aware of it, but they were not so aware of it. And there was not, not that much contact between white people and black people and whatever, what other forms of justifications. Um, let's all remember that for 800 years, you had black Moors, African Moors who ruled over Spain um, in the midst of the Middle Ages, uh, doing outstanding intellectual achievements, whether it's um, completely uh, free uh, universal education, building more than, um, you know, I think it's like 10 or 11 universities when the rest of Europe had only two, public baths and, and so on. Um, and today, I mean, we totally acknowledge the presence of the, of the Moors in Spain. It's not to say that we don't, but it seems like we often forget that um, these people, a lot of them were, were black Moors. Although, I mean, Moors, you know, come from also a mix of Berber and um, Arabs. Um, and it was through, I mean, even the, the, the battle uh, where, I think it was it, I mean, I don't want to say something totally wrong, but I think it was Charlemagne or somebody, I'm not sure, but there was a battle that they lost. And in that battle, it was fought by, um, by Moors, by black Moors. Um, so everybody is, and during the middle ages, let's remember it was a dark age for Europe, uh, no um, scientific innovation that much, not, not a lot was happening. And all the knowledge that the Moors and the, um, and the Arab, Muslims brought with them, so the Moors also being a Muslim, um, all that they brought with them to Europe helped uh, to, to get out of the dark age um, and to go towards Renaissance. And mark the date 1492, I mean, that's another thing that we need to investigate. 19, for, uh, uh, 1492 is also the year where of the pseudo discovery of the Americas by um, Christopher Columbus. I'm saying, I'm saying pseudo for the term discovery, not for the fact that he went there. Um, so yeah, so just examples of what the Moors did. Um, so moving to the next slide is just um, 
this just again, when, what, why do we give all this background information is just to contextualize the creation of, of this concept of race and racism that has shaped our world into the racialized uh, world that we're in. Um, and we, we coined racism or the construction of the four races with uh, Carl von Linne in uh, 17, 1753. Um, so he actually acquired his nobility, this title of nobility, because of his outstanding work. Um, so maybe even removing that, I don't know if it, he's lost it since then, but he's the one who classified the four races, um, white, black, brown, and no, white, black, red, and yellow. Uh, but before him, um, uh, Estelle, if you could click on the PowerPoint. So that's Carl von Linne. Yeah, just continue clicking. So just, we won't go through all of these people, but before him, there were architects, a lot of architects in the development of racialized thinking. So here you have uh, Colbert and Louis, um, et Louis XVI, you know, with the whole uh, black code that codified the inferiority, um, I mean, uh, in their terms, inferiority of black people in the 17th century um, and legalized slavery and, you know, associated um, uh, black people with, uh, how do you call that, tables and, and chairs and all of that. Um, so you had um, even religious people who, who doubted these, that's the men that you have there. I mean, we don't need to spend too much time on them because it's not like what they had to say was very uh, intelligent. Uh, but it's just to express that um, what Candy said, this is a quote by Bram Candy, it's like, unlike babies, well, it depends in which cultures, but unlike babies, phenomena are typically, typically born long before humans give them names. Um, and basically, um, um, Estelle, if you could click on the presentation again, um, even with the, um, the last one that was there, even with the Arabic slave trade, uh, you had in it, you know, uh, this is Iban Kadum. Um, you had in it um, texts that showed uh, that they were basically attributing all negative stereotypes, including lack of humanity, to um, a Black people. So we've said all this. Um, I hope that through this, you understand the link between African history. Um, and teaching anti-racism because anti-racism, although, okay, uh, you can move to the next slide, please. Um, and just click and go on until everything appears. Um, um, anti-racism, if I take again the, the definition by Candy, um, just click one more. It's a powerful collection of anti-racist policies that lead to racial equity and are sub substantiated by anti-racist ideas. Um, it's really important. And the reason why I even share all of this with, with young students is just for them to understand the sort of legacy that they're carrying uh, with them uh, unconsciously most of the time when they you know, embark in those funny racist jokes, funny um, uh, anti-Asian jokes, funny sexist jokes. You could apply it for almost everything. It's important for them to understand what type of legacy. And in the last course I, I gave is, it's, I just told them that, imagine, you know, Carl von Linne high-fiving you, passing you the torch of like totally, I mean, completely uh, fake theories for the racist joke you just made. And uh, it's really important for them to just grasp, grasp this, that it's more than just uh, uh, your individual behavior. Your individual behavior is extremely important, uh, but you need to understand just like as much as you research things that are of a high value to you or of a high cost, um, this one being racist or anti-racist is something that has high value and high cost, but you need to understand the value of your commitment to one or the, or, uh, the other standpoint. Um, so yeah, I'll just conclude. So the next slide, well, yeah, two, two slides, just saying that part of what anti-racism entailed is investigating the history of race and in, in doing so reestablishing in our minds and collective memory, the richness and complexity of the most ethnically diverse continent in the world, the birthplace of human beings, the mother of civilizations, and that is Africa. 
So once again, also an important thing that I, that I didn't share here is that why did I here put ethnically diverse, most ethnically diverse continent? It's just to remind everybody that this conception of white, black, yellow, and red doesn't not only make, it doesn't make any sense. And one of the reasons for that is just to remember that before um, this classification was made, um, kinship bonds, you know, were not based on the color of your skin. And I'm using Africa as an example because it's something that you notice even today is that in the same family, you can have people of all shades of black, brown, and white in the same household. So this is not to just, I mean, this is just the same household uh, with two parents. Um, and if you extend that to the whole continent, it is something that is clearly visible, this ethnic, that's diversity in skin tones. So it's just to explain that, again, diversity did not create racism. Um, it, it's not ignorance that created racism. Um, maybe today, ignorance perpetuates racism. Um, but it, it was not the foundation of, of um, racialized thinking. So tips for educators that want to um, teach anti-racism and, and, um, and focus on African history. Well, to be very frank, um, one of the things is that you're gonna have to research a lot. I mean, I don't like to lie about this. Uh, so this is why the second tip is, uh, about also researching working teams. If you're several people in your school interested in this or in your professional learning community, if you have one, then try to create teams and work together because it's a lot to explore. And not everything is in strict, pure history. You have to also look into other disciplines to find a lot of elements about African um, uh, history, including, um, you know, um, um, what um, Philomen, Dr. Philomen presented uh, earlier. So everything that is linked to spirituality, the understanding of um, uh, immaterial and material world, you get a lot of, of um, knowledge into the, the socioeconomic and especially the sociological uh, functioning of African societies. Um, I mean, of course, there's a lot to research, but it'd be good to focus on the time period or the themes that may appear most relevant to you. Um, and um, an important element also is to challenge the dominant narratives and share alternative accounts. But if you can't share alternative accounts because you don't know them so well, at least express reservations with your students. That's one of the things that I think that um, I got a little, how can I put this? I got a little played by school um, because I wish I had known a few things that I know now about certain philosophers, thinkers, uh, because we say we need to separate the man or the person from the art. But I mean, if you're in the creative process, like anybody who's an artist or a just um, in, um, a writer will know that you, 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 part of who you are is represented in your work. So it's not about dismissing everything that the person has done, but it's about at least expressing reservations when you know that this story has now been considered as maybe controversial, like an example is the discoveries of the Americas by Christopher Columbus. Many, 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 many sources are available on that. If you just type, did he really discover the Americas or research black before Columbus came, which is also a history about um, the numerous exchanges between African civilizations and American civilizations before uh, Christopher Columbus came and him himself wrote about it. That's also something that is quite, that is quite stunning to me. I don't understand how somebody would tell you, oh, this is what happened and still, you know, the whole system of, uh, of whitewashing of history is, is still ongoing. Even when the person themselves, we glorify, acknowledge some of the you know, some of the links between um, other civilizations versus just the one between Europe and, and the Americas. Um, involve, oh yeah, investigate indigenous knowledge. So we were talking about the lack of resources. If ever you live in, an, um, let's say an African country, 
um, you know, and you have access to, let's say, ancient, um, I, would, I would not say ancient people, that's it, but what I mean, ancient sites, uh, older, let's say, older communities, where you still have a good sense of the knowledge, where you still have a strong, um, a, a strong link to their identity, founding stories like uh, here in Mali, even all this week, we had a Dogon, Dogon fair. The Dogon people are extremely important in African history uh, in terms of their um, astro astronomical findings, like um, in astronomy, in science, in sciences, in medicine as well. They're really important. So you do get um, events where this type of knowledge and people get celebrated, uh, but also just through your personal links when you, if you are in an African country, uh, that's something that you can do. And lastly, involve your students because, you know, many of us have said this today, you know, it's, it's not just you. When I do this class, a lot of the things are done by, by students, especially researching movements uh, when we get to the commitment to, to resistance, resisting these, I let students explore different ways that people have um, resisted from, you know, they know Black Lives Matter today, but what came before on all continents and the diversity of people who are involved in rejecting this, whether it was Europeans or, or Asians or, or, you know, uh, Africans or people from, or Americans, um, and people from all the, the islanders and every, like everybody was involved in rejecting this. So it's really good to involve the students. It will be great learning uh, experiences for them as well. Um, and so, yeah. Um, oh yeah, a few resources. So I would say that be a critical thinker always when you go through the resources because not everything is accurate. And basically what maybe one source will have 70 or 80 percent of information that's accurate and another 10 percent that's not either that's incomplete or inaccurate and this is why you have to cross and um cross check uh different for example when timelines or or histories and and there is so much and use your ana analytical power as well you know use your analytical power as well um of course this is why you have to like check your biases all of that coming with an open mind, coming with an understanding that you may not have been exposed to this as a, as a student yourself, but it doesn't mean that it's untrue. Um, and yeah, it's important to just be super critical when going through the different uh, sources. Um, so yeah, thanks. I'll open the floor for questions now. And thank you, everyone. <laughs> thank you so much, Estelle. That was so inspiring. I haven't been able to check the chat, uh, but I can see it's on fire with over 40 intervention. So it's going to be really, really hard to have all of the questions answered. But I think that people will also just uh, reacting to what you were saying and um, expressing their interest on uh, in the topic. Um, someone says here, I like your idea of linking current protests to all the protest movements, drawing a line through the past to show how Africans have resisted. Yeah, these false um, these false uh, uh, truths about well, false truth. These these false uh, statements about their inferiority. I like it too. Uh, um, and uh, compliments, you exude a wonderful energy as you speak. So that's from Magali. Um, yes. <laughs> uh, going to try and get a question here from, from Maite. Uh, how do you think that organized religions, religions have reinforced racist ideas right through history, in your opinion? Um, you have mentioned you have been working with various, oh, uh, sorry, I lost that, that remark uh, because there's so many piled up, but do you want to comment on organized or monotheist, this monotheistic religions and the impact on the development of racism? Mm. 
Sure. Um, it's definitely a sensitive question. So I don't want anybody to feel hurt in their belief or anything. Um, you know, you're not also responsible for what different people who belong to your faith have done um, with your faith. So um, having said that, it is 100% known and clear that if we take Christianity to begin with, um, it was used as um, a tool to justify slavery, for example, um, with reinforcing that narrative. So I explained the cursing of Ham. Um, um, I want, basically, Ham is a son of Noah who has seen uh, Noah naked uh, and drunk and did not and decided to call the people and I mean his brothers. And when Noah and his brothers did not look at the, the nudity of his um, of his uh, of their father, but uh, Sham, uh, Ham did. So when Noah found out, he cursed Ham's descendants, and Ham's descendants was Canaan, and Canaan was an area. So where you have modern day uh, Lebanon and Syria and all that area, um, where at the time it was part of of um, an ancient Egyptian empire. Uh, so you had uh, brown and, and black people there. But the thing is, not, nowhere in the text is the, is the color black mentioned, but it's just the, the folk stories. So, you know, it's a, a, a initially it's a J Jewish story um, um, as part of the founding, um, I mean, stories. Sorry for the use of story because it's a religious text. But so it's a Jewish account and um, that was used you know, in Christianity and also in Islam, uh, nowhere in there does it says that the person is black, but um, additional, you know, those side texts that are taught, oh, sorry, that are taught by different people who say that they are teaching the religions, when they've interpreted, interpreted these texts, they've associated um, Canaan with different types of behavior and colors and attributes, so darkness, um, uh, and negative stereotypes. And a lot of people have used this to, I mean, in the text, it also says that um, Noah says that Ham's descendants will become slaves, the slaves of the other, the other sons. And because that, that story is the basis for the sort of grouping of different um, populations. So saying that the descendant of this son of Noah became uh, became Europeans and this one became uh, um, that part of, um, part of the, the, the Middle East and so on, then basically um, people have interpreted this text and used them against um, Black people specifically to justify slavery uh, and to explain that they lacked a lot of um, yeah, humanity. So they definitely played a role. Uh, they definitely played a role. I mean, the Bible, <laughs> the Bible was used. You even had uh, was it Desmond Tutu who said um, when they came, we had the land. They asked us to close our eyes and pray. And when we opened their their when we opened our eyes, they had the land and we had the Bible. That's um, Desmond Tutu. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So, yeah. So it's Desmond Tutu. So just that's just a clear. Um, account of you know the the role that these religious religions play or the use of those religions by the people who are interested in justifying their action uh, played in justifying slavery colonization and so on. Mm, yes, we did discuss this this morning. How um, 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 religions uh, desacralized the authorities, the, the indigenous authorities, and and hence uh, opening the way to further uh, uh, appropriation of the land. Okay, so thank you. There's also a question from Philip here asking if you could expound a bit on pre-Columbian contacts between Africa and the Americas. Okay, um, so I will share, it's not in my resources, I will share this talk 
um, which um, it's, it's, it's from this um, conference that talk about disruptive ideas and so on, where, and there's even another book called Blacks Before Columbus Came. And so basically uh, when Christopher Columbus, well, the story start actually doesn't start with Christopher Columbus. This it's in the, um, I think if I'm not mistaken, somewhere around either 18th or 19th century, you had um, uh, a European uh, botanist and, and um, basically, let's say anthropologist who went to the Americas and kind of um, studied the sort of connection between and resemblance between um, seeds and plants in the Americas, I think it was in Ecuador, uh, and um, the ones that you find in Africa. And from there, he started thinking about drawing uh, the, the link between these things. So it, it included seeds and, and, and things that could not travel by sea, like plantains, for example, they could not have traveled by sea. And so he started just digging and digging and looking to find more accounts about potential links between um, Africa and the Americas. Now, Christopher Columbus, uh, himself when he arrived um, to the Americas um, in conversations with the, the locals um, identified, for example, spears, spearheads. And when they took it back to Europe, they saw that it was the same metal composition that were used by, um, that were used in spearheads in West Africa. And the people there, and, and, and had one metal, for example, called Guanin, uh, and that they even called uh, the city there had almost the same name as a as that as that metal and basically there were just a lot of evidence and even the people expressing um the people from the southern native americans um of southern america or central and southern america actually even northern if you include all of Mex mexico northern central southern america um the, basically they they found different uh, accounts but even themselves said that this gold and this metal was brought to us by dark-skinned people that came from the east um and just you like in the metals in the food uh and even in the depictions of um of 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 people and their ancient things so on caves and so you would see dark skinned people um, in there that were clearly part of the, the, the culture, part of the, the, the culture already well integrated in the, the communities in, in, in the Americas. Um, other, other elements, so aside food, aside names, aside metals, uh, also include those huge status, um, uh, huge um, statutes that you have pointing, looking east. Uh, I think they're called the Omecas. Um, and basically, they, um, yeah, it's, it's another thing that people don't really understand what there would be a depiction of um, uh, dark, black, African looking people on the middle of, you know, in, in the Americas, in Mexico, looking east. Um, and all of those are just links that show, that demonstrated, but even, um, you know, there were accounts by Christopher Columbus, I forgot exactly what he said, but basically acknowledging that you had um, Black people who were sailing to the Americas long, long, long ago before he came. Um, uh, he knew he was not the first person who had ever gotten there. But at the same time, you had in 1492, the fall of the Moors and a whole nother sort of power dynamics that, that was created um, in Europe. So it would also make sense that they didn't really want to glorify um, the existence of this link between um, the Americas and, and Africa. Um, yeah. Okay. And, but, and just another thing that I would say to that is even in the Malian empire, same thing that if you take the his, history from the African continent, so I gave, I spoke of accounts of, uh, Europeans and Americans, but also from the African continent. So Mansa Musa and other leaders. So Mansa Musa is, um, is 14th century. Um, he also explained that, he explained the sort of voyage that people were doing, um, his people were doing towards the Americas. Um, yeah. Thank you, thank you. That, that's fascinating actually. It really makes me feel like checking this out. We had a question here from Alex. Um, about, you know, this, we're here talking about Africa, 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 
um, this morning when we, we actually had the opportunity to differ differentiate between all of these empires, Bambara, Dogon, and, and, and extra. And the question I think, if I recall, is is it damaging to the way we form, uh, um, uh, the way we are, we, it might make us miss uh, the diversity of, of African people, African thought, African cultures. So what do you think about this global approach to Africa? And even, I mean, that's what we find, find in, in the notion of Pan-Africanism really. Is Pan-Africanism or the generalization of, you know, uh, 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 of this problematic to Africa as a whole, is it damaging uh, to the cause we're trying to defend? Mm. Well, it, it depends on who's the point of reference. Um, I mean, it's damaging to, like, if we live with others as the as a point of reference so we don't want them to think that we're all the same but then <laughs> but that's what i that's that's what i mean by that so in itself is it damaging i i will i would say that the reason why we speak of of africa like this um, as a whole is i mean you could find grounding for this when dr Philomen spoke this morning he clearly uh stress this sort of common narrative as to uh, the understanding of um, of the immaterial immaterial world the creation of life um, the theory of, of, of knowledge of Africa. exactly basically yeah the theory of knowledge of Africa that all all come I mean all start with this idea of water and the you know the that, that God came came from water. And, and uh, so we have a lot of common history. That's something that we need to be very proud of. It, it's, we have a common history. And when we say common history, it's not you know, starting with colonization being our common history or slavery as being our common history, but it's that theory of knowledge, that common history, that common respect. You had a presentation on, on women, that, that respect for, for, for women, that respect for elders, um, you know, there are common values that are, uh, that are there and that cannot be dismissed. Um, a second thing is, um, I used to represent Pan-Africanism sometimes in the presentation, I'll say, oh, I'm a Pan-African woman from Cameroon and I lived in this and that country. And I used to put this image of the African continent with all the flags, but then I realized, I mean, why am I even promoting this image? Because what all, all these, I mean, the, not the flag specifically, but the borders, um, they are not, they don't make sense to me. To me, those, that's my personal opinion, but they don't also make sense. So we also, I mean, I would be, I think it would make even more sense to not think in terms of country, but to think in terms of maybe groups, similar groups like the Man, Mandika groups or the, the, the Hausas, uh, if the countries or the regions were maybe more in, in tune with th those sort of, um, of uh, realities, then I think it would make more sense. So um, yeah, it's, it's, it's damaging because it, it, in the sense that it could be simplifying uh, our complexity, but I think that if you're aware that we are complex, then it's not damaging. Like, you know what I mean? It's about how- totally. Totally, the idea of, of finding uh, strength in, in unity, in unity. Uh, uh, and counterbalancing also uh, the simplification of, of Africa through, through other channels. Um, thank you so much, Estelle. We've got one last question for you. I see that we've got some students, some very young students from uh, Yaoundé, uh, from Douala who joined us. And I think that the children wanted to say something about uh, what they learn uh, about history at school. So we have just one last question for you, Estelle, before I give them the floor. Thank you, Olga, for joining us. Thank you. Um, thank you, Madame, uh, um, Madame Jenny, uh, for, for allowing the children to come. Can you, can you say hi to us if you can hear us? Fantastic, we can see you. Thank you for joining. And mm -hmm. so we'll, we'll give you the floor in a minute. Estelle, there was one question about your trainings uh, at international schools. Um, your course, our course twice, has, has, has been now offered to over 
I'd say 15 schools around, uh, considering, you know, if we add also the work that we've done on the African continent. And the, ask, the question was, how do you feel about the response that you get? Maybe you want to compare the work on the African continent versus here, if uh, relevant. Um, the response is positive. Um, that's what I want to say. <laughs> the response is positive. People are happy to get the opportunity to talk about these, um, these topics, um, you know, maybe individually, if it was not mandated by the school, maybe they would have not done it. Maybe they would have. But the thing is, they're super happy to get the opportunity. I do feel like people are open minded. Uh, I didn't have any clashes or anything weird happening. Um, even with the students, they're just really happy to, to engage in, on this topic, to understand why it matters, and to understand that they've been kind of deprived of it, and that it's adding to their conceptions, it's adding to the formation of their mental structures, it's helping them making more sense of who they are and what their purpose is, in the world and to also understand that yeah it's we are there are several people they're not all alone thinking that there is a problem with maybe the way things are run in their school the way things are taught at their schools and that it's good to see that there's you know what we're doing with SL is also just contributing to this movement uh, towards more um, inclusion so definitely positive response yeah I'd say so I mean, um, you do the trainings uh, in, in, you've done the training so far uh, on the European continent. I've been more involved on the African continent. And it's true that on the African continent, it's been really refreshing to see, uh, uh, to, to, to see the enthusiasm of, of, of Africans discussing these issues in international schools in Africa, where sometimes people feel that they have to leave their Africanness at the door because now they are entering the international school. And in Europe, for, for other, it's refreshing for, for, for another reason, I guess, Estelle, uh, that you really have the impression that you're opening new windows, right? Uh, to, to, uh, uh, to people, new, new avenues for, for reflection. I know for sure that uh, at my school, Campus des Nations Ecolin, the students have read it in the, in the newsletter because I don't attend Estelle's training um, when, she, when she trains in my school because it's just, uh, it would be just weird. But I, I just get the positive feedback from everybody. And, and I have to say that, that it's been great and, and people have really appreciated the work that you've done uh, from where I stand. So bravo for, for that work. Um, so uh, the next presenter is, is Conrad, but before we get there, we are going to, to just change the schedule a little bit because I don't want the, the, the children to wait too much. So um, Olga, I'm going to open your mic and just do a, a little bit of, of, uh, of context. I was talking with one of uh, my, uh, Ali's partner in, Cam in Cameroon, Douala, Ms. Jenny, who's head of school of uh, Calgary School in, in Cameroon. And I said, yeah, we have this, um, this conference on teaching African history in the 21st century. And we really want to know how some African children respond to the way they learn history at school. Do they like it? What do they learn? Uh, do they think it's important? So I see that there are some students sitting there I'm going to open the mic and maybe uh, you can first come to the, uh, to the mic and say your name, introduce yourself. You can unmute now if you like. Um, here we go, you are unmuted. So how many of you are sitting there? Nine, nine of them, nine. Nine students, super. So um, maybe just tell us your names for where you're sitting, your first name or your full name as you wish. My name is Ashima Ron Wisdom. Hi. My name is Apa Precious. Hi, 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 hi. I, I just let you go, go everyone says, and then we'll. Please. 
Speak up. Chama Donglen Chris. Hi. My name is Tandon Brownie Daliti. Welcome. My name is Greta Boris Daliti. Good to see you. Excellent. My name is Kemba Boris are you sure you're getting it? Okay. All okay, right. We are done. All right. So brilliant. So um, one question for, for anyone who wants to come and answer. Not everybody has to answer. And not every, we don't need one question, one answer per question. Can someone tell us what you are learning in history class? What you have learned in history class um, this year? Yeah, whoever wants to talk can come to next to the to the computer. Oh, yeah, well done to the courageous first person. It's never easy to be the first one to speak. Well done to you. You're the risk taker. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. yeah, my name is Kenga Fayora. Mm -hmm. I'm glad to be part of this program. And it's a privilege for me to speak to you on what I know about the issue of Africa. Okay. What are you learning uh, uh, this year in history class? I learned that. Before the scrum for Africa, Africa had been under slave trade for over 400 years. So, there was so after the suppression of slave trade, it came colonization, which the Africans scrambled for, which the European power scrambled for Africa for many reasons, like economic, social, and political reasons. And there were several European countries involved in the scramble like Britain, France, Germany, Italy, Spain, Belgium, and Portugal. And there was conflict between these parts, which almost led to a war. And that led to the summoning of the Berlin West African Conference, 1884 to 1885, which laid down principles that any, any European powers wishing to, wishing to acquire territories in Africa must follow. And that, principle led to the successful partition of Africa. British took the highest, the highest share. So each colonial power implemented her own colonial rule in their own, in their own territories. Like the British for indirect rule, whom they ruled their people through their chiefs and the France for assimilation. And they believed that the Africans were black French citizens, the Belgians and the, Ger and the Germans for partisans, which were like parents and children. So due to the, like their harsh rule, it led to, the, to native resistances, which they, they resisted against the European powers because of their harsh rule. So, it was suppressed, the native resistances never last long. It was suppressed by the European powers. So after the, after the resistance, there was, a, there was a outbreak of the First World War, which was extended in Africa. And the Africans were trained as soldiers to fight in the war, which, and the war also affected the Africans, both positively and negatively. Like, the negative impact was like, there were destruction of houses, separation of families, and the destruction of native cultures, like polygamy, clean of twins, female genital mutilation. So, and the positive impact. Thank you so much. It's true, there's a, there's a lot to say, but you, you showed us a lot of, of knowledge of, of history. Thank you so much. 
Uh, I think we can give her a round of applause. <laughs> yes, maybe someone else can come forward and answer the, a, a second question. Um, who likes history? Who doesn't like history? Just express your opinion about history, how, uh, how learning about history makes you feel and tell us why. So who wants to come forward? It looks like we have a connection issue. Um, yes, that was a very eloquent uh, student, uh, but Olga, Olga is, uh, is disconnected. So um, and let me just read uh, some of the comments here. Uh, Prosepina was acknowledging the fact that we have an eloquent, an eloquent speaker here, but uh, still um, uh, surprised at how Europeanized the, the, the version of history is here, where it starts, right? And, um, and, and how Africa still seems to be a little bit in the margin in the general account of, of history here. And there we have a very bright child uh, uh, sharing uh, how she feels uh, history goes. Uh, fascinating. The children will be back, I'm sure.